Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C. We're going to do some more A&P today. Specifically, we are going to check out the muscles that make up the arm and the forearm. And there's quite a bit of stuff here, so let's get to it. So, arms, arms, and more arms. That's what we're doing today. Some of the forearms are especially difficult for some people. So we're going to take our time to go through this, but... Let's check out the muscles that make up the arms and the forearms. First, let's start with the easy stuff, right? The big forearm flexors. So the one that you probably heard about, people just call it biceps, but the actual term is biceps brachii, meaning simply two-headed muscle of the arm. Now there is a biceps femoris, also a two-headed muscle down in the leg. So calling it the biceps is a little incorrect. So we're going to call it biceps brachii. And you see it over here in the red color. And it's got two branches there up at the top, kind of makes this V. So coracobrachialis is this green guy, and I can point to him right here. And then the little blue one down at the bottom, this is brachialis. So let's check out all three of the details here. So we often say with the biceps being that it has two heads, it's got a short head and a long head. And sometimes when the image is cut off, the shorter one looks longer than the longer one, which is unfortunate. But technically, the long one is this guy here that I'm pointing at right now. And it originates at the supraglenoid tubercle. There's a little bump right on top of the glenoid cavity on the scapula called the supraglenoid tubercle. And the short head is over here attaching at the coracoid process of the scapula. Now they both insert at the same place. Down, notice that the radius, the radial tuberosity, none of the biceps brachii touches the humerus. It goes over the humerus. It grows over the humerus. So it doesn't move the humerus. It moves it indirectly by moving the forearm, right? So biceps brachii is mainly known for flexion of the forearm, but it also does a supination. It lets you turn it over and put your palms up where you're begging for your soup. And it's going to be innervated by musculocutaneous. So are the other two on this chart, branches of C5 to C7 roots. Okay, coracobrachialis is a great one because it tells you exactly where its attachments are. Again, I'll point with this red arrow over here to this green muscle. Some of it is obscured by biceps brachii, but it originates coracoid process, inserts in the middle of the shaft of the humerus. Again, it's obscured by the biceps muscle at the moment, and it helps you adduct, that is pull the arm back to the midline of the body, and of course flex the arms, so major forearm flexors. Brachialis is the third here of the prime movers of the forearm flexion, and it will originate, well, it's, first of all, it's the blue one down here just to remind ourselves. It originates in the distal shaft of the humerus. Again, it's obscured by biceps brachii, and inserts into the coronoid process of the ulna bone. This will, of course, allow you to flex your forearm, innervated the same way as the others. Okay, as far as the forearm extensors go, uh, the big one is the big boy in the back called the triceps. Now, it's technically called triceps brachii because it has three heads instead of two like the biceps brachii does. And so here is the triceps brachii. I can put some lines down it here if you want to see it more visually. It originates, at least the long head of the three originates at the infraglenoid tubercle, another one of those lumps associated with the glenoid cavity on the scapula. Now that is up here, so this here must be the long head of the triceps brachii. Now the lateral and medial heads both originate at the radial sulcus of the humerus, which is a strange term, but the radial nerve slides through a groove down the humerus, and it's called the radial groove of the radial sulcus. Now the lateral head I can see, I'll circle it right here, but what I cannot see is the medial head. So the long head is here, I'm circling it. The lateral head is here, I'm recircling it. And the medial one's kind of blocked. It's in between those, but it's underneath there. It will insert, and again, the ulna way down here will cross the elbow to help us extend the forearm. So extension of the forearm is the obvious one, but it does help adduct or bring the arm back to the midline of the body, innervated by the radial nerve. And conius is this little guy down here, 
which is a very strange, small muscle to most people. And it will be a little helper of triceps brachii. So it is a synergist. There are its origins and insertions and so forth, but it is a weak extender of the forearm. And like I said, it's pretty much tricep brachii, his little friend that helps him when we need some extra motion, some synergy. Okay, now where things get tough, I mean, those muscles up there, those aren't too difficult for most people to handle. But when we get into the anterior and posterior forearm compartments, it does get a little confusing. So I'll try to make this as streamlined as I can. Think of it this way. There are eight anterior forearm muscles. There are going to be 12 posterior. So eight anterior forearm muscles. The trick we're going to do is four minus one equals three. And so we're going to have three layers, essentially, that we learn these as. There's a superficial layer, and there will be four muscles in that superficial layer. In the middle layer, there's only one muscle all by itself, so it must be pretty big. And then the deepest layer of the anterior forearm muscles has three muscles on it. So four minus one equals three. That will give us all eight. Most of them are just simply flexors. So that's kind of the default answers. Although you see the wrist action over here, we're doing a little pronation, right? So some of them do assist in pronation or their only function is pronation. On the image on the right, we can see a good example of flex wrist. Although I'm not showing in that image flexing the hand or the fingers specifically. Although I'll show that when we need to get there. So let's look at these eight anterior forearm muscles. Four minus one equals three. Okay, the group of four. So the way to handle these most superficial wrist flexors is to do this little trick here. And if you put your thumb right on your medial epicondyle of your humerus, and then you lay your four fingers on top of your forearm, you're pretty much sitting on the landmarks of where these four muscles are. And the trick to learn them in order is just simply pass, fail, pass, fail very simply pf pf so the first p is pronator teres teres telling me that it's a round muscle pronator telling me exactly what it does it's going to pronate the wrist again pronate means to put the palm down supinate means to put the palm up so the yellow muscle i'll put a little x on it right here is pronator teres okay the next finger there is an f so it's a flexor carpi radialis. It tells you exactly what's going on. It flexes the wrist. We saw the image of that in the previous slide, but it's attached to the radius. So it's called flexor carpi radialis. Palmaris longus is like it sounds. It's a very long muscle that heads all the way up right about to here where I'm putting the X on the palm and circling it. It heads up to right at the base of the palm. So that's called palmaris longus. It's the purple muscle on the left-hand shot. And then the little skinny red guy out here, I'll just put a little arrow pointing to him. That's another flexor carpi muscle. It's another flexor of the wrist, but it's connect connected to the ulna bone. So it's called flexor carpi ulnaris. All right, so there's that first layer, that superficial layer that has four. PF, PF, pass, fail, pass, fail. The intermediate layer, remember, just has one in it. And we're looking at it. It's very broad, it's very flat, and it's very long. And its name is flexor digitorum superficialis. So it allows you to do this. It allows you to pull your fingers down, but not quite make a fist, right? It's kind of a fake fist. You're not going to curl your fingertips under, nor will you curl your thumb over. So notice right here, I'm going to kind of draw a big thing around the attachments on the fingers. Notice how they attach there, the fibers of flexor digitorum superficialis. They attach on the middle phalanx of those digits, two through five. Notice they don't go all the way out to the distal phalanges. So you can do, again, you can do this action with them, but you can't actually curl up into the fist all the way. We're going to need another muscle to help us do that. And it's going to be one of these deeps. Remember, there's going to be three of these deeps. And when you do these, now you can do the motion you see on the lower right of your screen. You can actually curl up your fingers all the way. And that's primarily because you're going to use one called flexor digitorum profundus, or the deeper flexor of the digits. 
Again, notice where the tips of the fibers go all the way to the tips of the fingers, all the way to the distal phalanges. So you can actually curl your fingertips around and make a proper fist. Now to get the thumb to come over and associate with those fingers while you're making a fist, you have to use flexor pollicis longus. Remember pollux, and I'll put the word here because we haven't seen it too much. Pollux is another word for the thumb. So we need a flexor of the thumb, and it's pretty long, so we'll just call it flexor pollicis longus. Now, if you add those two motions, use your flexor digitorum profundus and the previous flexor digitorum superficialis, and then pull your thumb over, and then pull your hand up to your face where you're going to like do a punch, you're going to slightly pronate your fist as you do this, right? You're going to roll it over, and you're going to do this using pronator quadratus. Remember, we had a pronator teres that was a round muscle. Now we'll have a pronator quadratus, which is more of a square or rectangular looking muscle. It's the green one on the picture there. So there are our eight muscles of the anterior forearm. Now to do the 12 muscles of the posterior forearm, we're going to apply some of the same games, right? There's going to be some layers here, but most people just learn these as the superficials and the deeps. And it says, just like we had the anterior forearm muscles, most of them were flexors. Most of these 12 are going to be extensors, although we will see, again, some of them associating in pronation and supination. Okay, and remember, we're not just extending the wrist. That's what you see her doing here in this picture. We're doing a wrist extension every time she flips it down. And remember, anatomical is here. There's the extension. There's the anatomical. There's the extension. As far as the extend, you know, the hand and the fingers and the thumb, you see that happening there. That would be opening up the fist, just like the opposite of where we closed it in the last discussion. All right, let's start with brachioradialis. Now, the main action here you can see him doing is going to be to flex the forearm. But let's check it out. So lateral border of humerus, which would be right over here, the very distal end of the lateral border of the humerus. And they'll insert, you can't see it in the picture, but it's going to stick on the little tip, the little tooth of the radius called the styloid process. Flexion is mainly what it's known for, but because of its position, you can both supinate and pronate the wrist, the forearm, uh, using this muscle. Innervated by the radial nerve. Okay. To get a little deeper now, remember we need 12, right? We're trying to get 12 of these posterior muscles. So I've put a B up here just to show you the arrow. That's the one we just saw, brachioradialis. A, I've put right there. That's for Anconius. That was that little tiny helper of the triceps brachii. So I won't be showing those a second time, but they are part of the story. So start with brachioradialis and then kind of work your way this way, and we're going to hit these muscles in order. So brachioradialis we just saw. Next is the blue one, extensor carpi radialis. Again, it's going to extend the wrist, but it's attached to the radius. So it's called extensor carpi radialis. Now there's a long version that's right here and a shorter version that's right here. So we do have a longus and brevis. Counted as two different muscles, but it's just colored one color here. The yellow one here is extensor digitorum, which makes sense. It's going to extend the digits. Notice where it attaches down here on the fingers. And then the green one here, it's very hard to see it. It's very slender, but the name tells you it all. Extends the small digit, right? The pinky finger, if you want to call it that in English. So extensor digiti minimi. Then the purple one, it's another extensor carpi muscle, but it's connected to the ulna now. So we're going to have extensor carpi ulnaris. So we can kind of work these the same way. Let's like sweep over this way and hit them in order. The supinator, right? The name gives it away very obviously. It's going to help us supinate the forearm and wrist. The red one here, abductor. Again, abduct to take away. The thumb, again, there's that pollicis word, meaning talking about the pollux. So a long muscle that abducts the thumb will be abductor pollicis longus. Now we do have another example here of a brevis and a longus version. Uh, let me clear the ink for you. The brevis is in the middle, and then the longest is this one right there. So this is the brevis, and there's the longest. Let me make my B better right there. So that's both of those orange ones are extensor pollicis, right? Extend the thumb, but there's a short one first, and then comes the long one as we're sweeping across. 
The little blue guy there extends your indices. Notice where it's going. It's going to the index finger or the pointer finger, right? So that's why it's called extensor indices because it will extend the index finger. So we'll wrap it up here by talking about tennis elbow, which can be caused by lots of things besides just tennis. I know, but colloquially it's known as tennis elbow. Fancily, it's called lateral epicondylitis, which means there's some sort of inflammation at the lateral epicondyle. So that's right here on the humerus. And what's going on there is you have a lot of these extensor tendons that are attaching these extensor muscles. And if you overuse them, you can cause some slight problems here. They can turn into larger problems. So this quick definition is any kind of inflammation, that's the itis there, or some sort of tearing, which would cause inflammation, of the tendons that join the forearm muscles to the elbow. This is caused almost every time by overuse or hyperuse uh, in a small period of time. Repetitive use is the key here. All right, hope you enjoyed that talk on the arm muscles. Thanks for watching. If you did, check out some more if you wish. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.